<laughs> Thank you all. It's a great time of, of singing. And um, what we're going to do is jump back into our study of Galatians. Here's so I get some new things moved. Hopefully, I didn't just mess up. We understand this was. But we've been in Galatians. And Galatians is a study of what the gospel is not. Just like Romans is a study of what the gospel is. And so in Galatians, we learn that the gospel is not religion. It's relationship. The gospel is not obligation. It's transformation. It's not duty, but delight. It's not prison, but passion. It's not man, but Jesus. And in the churches of Galatia, they had really corrupted and taken the gospel and made it into a set of rules and traditions and standards by which, if you lived it, they would say, well, God will love you then, God will accept you, and God will bless you. And Paul is coming back and saying, that is totally opposite of the gospel. God does not love, accept, and bless you because of you following rules. He loves, accepts, and blesses you because the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ, because through faith, you get all the promises of God, which are yes and amen in Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus, not you and I. It's that Jesus is good, not us. It's that He's holy, righteous, good, and accepted in the eyes of our Father. So, so Galatia, the church of Galatia had really um, done a number to the gospel, and this is why this becomes Paul's most impassioned epistle or letter. Um, and in this, we've come to the climax, which is chapters 5 and 6. And last week we looked at the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Our flesh, every one of us, our flesh has passions and desires. Those passions and desires compel us to lead God and to do our own thing, to love ourselves. But when we come to faith in Christ, we get the spirit, and the spirit produces passions and desires in our life as well. Those passions and desires compel us to draw near to Jesus, to love God, and to love others. But, as we looked at last week, Paul says, if the passions and desires of the flesh are the driving force in your life, they'll, they'll be indicators. It'll come out. First, he, he pointed to sexual perversion. If you're following the flesh, it will come out. Your pornography, adultery, romance novels, all of the perversions sexually are a result of living by the flesh. Also, the flesh comes out socially through divisions, infighting, anger. It comes out spiritually by trying to manipulate God. Hey, if I do this for God, if he's obligated to do this for me, uh, by throwing our time, talents, and energy into something other than God and worshiping things other than the true living God. And lastly, it comes out through addictions, through passions that end up enslaving us. Drinking, eating, spending money, these things that can easily master us. And that's how those are the different ways the flesh comes out in our lives. But last week, we, we also looked at how the Spirit how the fruit of the Spirit comes out of our life. Not the fruit of Troy, the fruit of you, but the fruit of the Spirit comes out of our lives. And there's indicators of that as well. We said that one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace, that we can actually sleep well, we can snore, right, as an act of worship to God. We can sleep and be at peace because that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. We can have joy as a natural part of each day, regardless of whether that's a good day or a bad day. We can be loving, kind, gentle. We can actually have concern for other people. All these things are the fruit of the evidence of the Spirit's work in our lives. And that doesn't come by rules. In other words, it's not by, as we said last week, it's not by posting a more extensive set of rules on your refrigerator and saying, boy, I'm going to be more disciplined this time around. I'm really going to go at it. I got more rules this time, I'm going to be more disciplined than ever this time, and I'm going to move from the flesh to the spirit. It doesn't happen that way. But we left it a little vague as to how do you pursue walking in the spirit. And that's where Paul is heading in Galatians. And that's where we're going to pick up in Galatians 6.1, if you have your Bibles this morning. Galatians 6.1. He says this, Brother, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. And so the first way that we go about walking in the Spirit and exhibiting the Spirit is, he says, brothers. He, he, he's talking to the church. There's a, 
there's an active participation in the local gathering of believers that is necessary in order to walk in the Spirit. He says, brothers here, and Paul in verse 10 of chapter 6 calls us the household of faith. In Ephesians 2.19, he uses the language that he calls us the household of God. Um, and so the first step in this is understanding that the church is to be a loving family, a larger family than just our individual families, but a loving family that through which we receive encouragement, support, instruction, guidance, admonishment. As you read the Bible, you understand that uniquely God is at work in the assembling of the believers. He uniquely works in the local gathering of the churches. And Paul is assuming in this letter that if he wants to write to communicate to Christians in an area, he just writes to the church. Is that assumed in our day? Often it's not, is it? Because so many people go, hey, I don't have to be active or involved in the church. I'm a Christian. This is my faith. It doesn't have to do with anything organized, anything structured, anything. And we'll deal with that in a little bit. Paul is assuming in this letter that if he wants to communicate to Christians in Galatia, that all he has to do is write to the church, that the Christians are a part of that. And we can see why, because to the Thessalonians he writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, he says, Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Uniquely, one of the things the Spirit does in our lives is without being taught anything, we instinctively as Christians know that we're to love other Christians. That's just, he says, it's, it's part of the course. And part of that love comes in when we're gathered, it comes through loving and forgiving and supporting and encouraging and challenging one another. And so Paul's assuming that that's critical for those wanting to be close with Jesus, for those wanting to have the Holy Spirit shine through their lives and be deeply connected to other believers. Um, and also implied in this is that there's a growing openness and transparency and honesty with other people about our lives. Uh, so that before there's a, a catastrophic failure in our life, like divorce, or ending up in bankruptcy, or ending up drunk, or whatever, the body is there to point us back to the right path, to point us back to walking with Jesus. And so we need a good church home, but part of that connection is biblical discipline, and that's what he's talking about here. If anyone, brethren, local church, gather... If anyone in, in that is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you will not be tempted. Here's the idea. The devil is out setting traps. The traps appeal to your flesh. They wouldn't be much of a trap if they didn't appeal to you. They're very deceptive. They appeal to you. And different traps appeal to different ones of us, depending on what our particular bent is or what we particularly, our flesh is driven towards. So the devil is out there setting traps so that you would fall into them, so that you'd be taken away from God, so you'd be taken away from the fellowship with Him. And if someone is caught in that, those who are spiritual are to go and restore them with gentleness, each washing themselves so that they're not led astray into that same sin. And this idea of gentleness is that mature people deal with others in their sin in very gentle ways um, because of the grace they've understood and the grace they've received from God they're very gentle with other people they don't so essentially when they come in they, they say I love you you know how much I've prayed for you how much I've sought to encourage you and how much uh, we've sought to connect together as, uh, as those who love Jesus and, and I'm coming to you because I see something, a pattern of sin in your life that is destructive to you and to your family and to those around you, and I want to help you out of that pattern of sin and back onto the path of righteousness. Now, keep in mind, he says if anyone's caught in a trespass, not a trespass against our methods, not a trespass against our conscience, a trespass is a violation of God's word. So they should have scripture that they're not making, you know, kind of, weird stuff out of, but it's actually biblically, contextually true, and they're coming to you going, this is true. If they come to you with stuff that's not even biblical, hey, you didn't wear a tie on Sunday, that's the devil's work, <laughs> you know, you go, then what God is trying to say to you is, you are actually 
he's trying to put you in a position to go to them. To, to they come to you, they they call you on something that's not even a trespass, and God is wanting you to actually turn around and say, actually, you're caught in legalism, and I want to help you out of it. The issue isn't a tie. The issue is the heart of a person before Jesus. And clearly, you've been caught in a trap of legalism. Let me help you out of that. And obviously, there's a whole lot of grace in these things. But the problem is self-righteous people who aren't mature at times come into our lives. And in their conceited, smug, self-righteous attitude, they come with their guns blazing. And, and this may have happened to you. I'm sure probably if you've been in a church for any length of time, that it has. And um, they accuse you, they blast you, they're angry, they're upset, they're, they're looking down on you. Um, and they walk away smugly going, I am God's righteous soldier and I let them have it. And in reality, they're just religious jerks who lack gentleness because they themselves are caught in a trap. But even while they themselves are caught in some religious trap, they're very intolerant of anybody else who would happen to get caught in a trap, aren't they? And so they do a whole lot of damage. They're trying to do eye surgery with a blunt instrument. Matthew 7 says that's not a good idea. They need to first have the humility of spiritual maturity so they come into your life with gentleness and grace and can help you. The other problem is even if you're mature and gentle, you're still susceptible. If anyone here thinks they're not susceptible to certain sins, you're crazy. The fact is we're all susceptible to sin. There are certain sins that we're more susceptible to, but we're all susceptible. And so when you go to help somebody caught in a pattern of sin, Paul says you're also in a dangerous place that you could get taken in by the sin that they're doing. Um, and so if you're not careful, all of a sudden, instead of you changing them, they've changed you. Instead of